time to do the job. Time to do the job! Behold the jobber of jobbers. Daniel. Daniel Jobber. <laughs> Time to do the job. It's all about the job and how you do it. What's up, everybody? This is the D Job, Danimal Daniel Jobber, coming to you with an episode of Jobbing Out with Danimal Daniel Jobber, 205 Live in the WWE Cruiserweight Report. This week, I'm proud to have the show coming to you courtesy of the Edmonton Sports Podcast Network. I'm proud to have my show alongside such great podcasts as Mike the Ref's own The Blown Call and his shorter podcast known as Quick Calls. It's also alongside such great Alberta wrestling shows such as CWC Evolution and RCW Breakout, featuring Mike the Ref's awesome wrestling commentary. Mike's commentary is so action-packed, it hits you like a shot in the mush. Finally, there's the Sounds of Struggle podcast, featuring the always entertaining Chris Parrish and Maniac. Whoa, those guys of chemistry. There's lots of great action on the Edmonton Sports Podcast Network. In my opinion, when it comes to sports, it's the real ESP. Uh, not going to go there. Don't want to upset the other sports network. As it stands, I may get sued by the people who bring you extrasensory perception as it is. Anyways, check them out, and when you realize what I already know, that they are the most awesome thing in Edmonton Sports Entertainment, be sure to visit the Edmonton Sports Podcast Network merchandise shop, courtesy of whatamaneuver.net. Be sure to get your shirts, and show Edmonton how proud you are to have such great local entertainment. Remember, you can enjoy the magic of Edmonton Sports Podcast Network on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play Music, and on the awesome mobile app Podbean. So now, on to the WWE action this week. On SmackDown Live, Maryville, Quebec's Kevin Owens beat Winnipeg's Chris Jericho to immediately reclaim the U.S. title after losing it to him two nights before on Payback. He also attacked him, apparently injuring him badly, and they had to help Jericho out of the ring to the backstage area. Of course, we all know Chris Jericho is leaving WWE for a while to tour with his rock band Fozzie and likely won't be back until the tour is over. Jericho is actually a pretty good rock singer, and if you get a chance to see Jericho and Fozzie perform, I take the opportunity. Also, Monday Night Raw had its worst ratings of the year this week. In my opinion, this is because they have a part-time missing in action Universal Champion, Brock Lesnar, who is not due to be defending his Raw title for two more months, which is a complete three full months after winning it from Goldberg at WrestleMania 33. I think the WWE should really reconsider this. Having their main Raw title off TV for such a long time is sure to hurt the brand. I feel they should change their mind and have Lesnar defend his title at the next Raw pay-per-view which is called Extreme Rules, and he should defend it against Finn Balor, the inaugural Universal Champion who deserves the first title shot as he was forced to forfeit the title uh, due to an injury, and he never really lost it to begin with, so I think he should be next in line as far as I'm concerned. But knowing the WWE is doubtful they'll do anything about it, and they'll probably just force their top contenders like Finn Balor to accept the champion sitting on his butt for three months while none of them get a shot. That's what it is. I think they need to get that title off Lesnar as soon as possible, though. Uh, by SummerSlam, the latest... If they want to have him to be, uh, main event WrestleMania again this or this year, they uh, WrestleMania 34. They should have him uh, be a rematch for the title, or or, or just have him be the uh, the challenger for the title. Because if you have him uh, in this kind of a schedule all year long, you're just going to hurt your brand all year, and that's just not worth it. That's a very poor way to uh, promote your number one brand, in my opinion. So, anyways, that's all fine and good. But here we're Albertans, and we have other things worth caring about. Calgary's own Jinder Mahal, nephew of former Stampede Wrestling great Gamma Singh, is getting a push in WWE and a WWE title shot, aided by the Singh brothers, formerly known as the Bollywood Boys. He has a chance to not only compete for the WWE Championship, currently held by uh, Randy Orton, but to revive the Singh name in his new small faction, which is designed to help promote the WWE in India. So let's get behind our Jinder Mahal and show our support for him in the new and important role he's been uh, put into. If he's able to help make the WWE more popular in India, that'd be a huge career achievement for our Calgary boy. Let's show the WWE Universe that regardless of whether an Albertan plays the role of a heel or a babyface, that we're one proud wrestling province. Alberta proud, Alberta strong. And of course, we still have Natalia Neidhart of Calgary's Hart family, who's also in a revised important new heel role on SmackDown Live. How about the blue brand, Alberta? Two Albertan superstars representing us on SmackDown Live. Anyways, now to the cruiserweight division. First off, why do I cover the cruiserweights? 
Well, besides being fun to watch, yet sadly underappreciated part of WWE, the WWE Cruiserweight division provides opportunity for a number of great Albertan wrestlers who happen to be cruiserweights themselves, basically under, under 205 pounds. Why should you listen to my podcast? Well, to follow the cruiserweights, you have two choices. You can sift through and watch hours of WWE television every week to watch the 5 to 8 cruiserweight matches, watch all the action, and try to take in and process all the stories yourself week after week, like I do. Consequently, you can job out with me for a half hour or so every week as I take you through the fast-paced and entertaining ride through the cruiserweight division action of the week. Personally, I think you should job out with the D-job here. I'll make it worth your while every week. Right here at home on the Edmonton Sports Podcast Network. Now to the busy and exciting week in the cruiserweight division. We got a whopping eight matches to take you through. Oof. Anyways, first off on NXT, we had a bonus match. Jack Gallagher took on Tyler Bate, the WWE United Kingdom champion. Uh, yeah, of course, Tyler Bate's not technically a cruiserweight, but Jack Gallagher is one of the stars of the cruiserweight division. And this is a very good scientific technical wrestling match most of the way. Lots of takedowns, leverage holes, skill leverage pins, etc. Now in the end, Jack Gallagher finally gets a drop kick and a couple vicious headbutts and almost gets the three count, but doesn't. And in the end, Tyler Bate wins with the Tyler Driver 97. The match was likely designed to generate publicity for the upcoming WWE Network uh, United Kingdom show they have planned. Some of the wrestlers who will be on the show are sitting in the front row watching, taking in all the action. So, Anyways, following that, uh, a few days later we had main event, and we had one cruiserweight match on the show, and it was Grand Metalik and Lince Dorado versus Drew Gulak and Tony Nice. Of course, uh, Drew Gulak is, is uh, the main guy in a storyline I like to call the Cruiserweight Crusade where he's trying to make the cruiserweights not wrestle like cruiserweights. Basically, no high-flying, just safe, responsible, technical wrestling. And he's been antagonizing Mustafa Ali uh, with this issue, because uh, Mustafa Ali is a, a high-flying wrestler. Personally, I think he should be taking on, uh, well, picking on Metalik and, and Dorado himself uh, instead, because they're actually, really, they, they're probably more high-flying than Mustafa Ali anyways. So, I mean, I think he should be taking on... Uh, Metalik and Dorado and challenging them rather than than uh, Mustafa Ali, but Mustafa Ali's been his target so far. So, anyways, to the match, as uh, typical tag team match for most of the way, baby faces off to a hot start. A dirty heel tactic interrupts the momentum and puts the heels uh, up up top. Basically, he gets them going, and they work over Lindsay Dorado for a while. Uh, Tony Nice does his move where he holds. Dorado upright for several seconds, showing off his strength, and then drops him on the top rope. However, Dorado actually slingshots around and has his neck bounce up and hit the bottom rope as he bounces off. Basically a new twist to the move, and look kind of interesting, nasty, more exciting. Anyways, following a hot tag to Grand Metalik, the Luchador has really put on a high-flying energy showcase. They even have the crowd cheering when they took turns, reversing, reverse vaulting off the top turnbuckle, one onto each of their two opponents outside the ring. Then Grand Metalik hits his Metalik driver in the ring on Drew Gulak and gets the victory. It's a great way to show Drew Gulak that they're not buying into his no-fly zone cruiserweight crusade. A uh, very fun match, anyways. Uh, why we're not seeing more of these guys on Raw and 205 Live, I have no idea. And why we're not giving these guys a storyline. Why not give uh, Metalik and Drew Gulak, or sorry, Metalik and, uh, and Dorado a storyline and get them involved in the cruiserweight division better? I don't know. Hopefully in time we'll start to see that. Because they're really entertaining to watch anyways. And then of course we had the pay-per-view WWE's Payback. And we had on that show the Cruiserweight Championship being defended. We had Neville the Cruiserweight Champion versus Austin Aries. A-W- A-double himself, pardon me. <laughs> match was actually a really good match. But really deserved a better ending in my opinion. The two men put on an energetic performance winning the crowd over. Neville carried the match early on by riling up the crowd with his constant crowd taunts. Aries was a little more quiet and subtle, but started getting the fans cheering for him to to win more than just for Neville to lose as the match went on. So he, you know, started to win them over. Then they just ruined a good match, in my opinion, when Austin Aries was about to make Neville tap out to the last chancery. Neville slowly manages to grab the ref shirt and in desperation pulls him down over top of them and interrupts the hold and the referee gets up and disqualifies him for grabbing his shirt. I mean, I was okay with Neville retaining the title, because, of course, you can't lose the title on a disqualification, but I felt the match deserved a better ending than that, uh, than a DQ finish. Disappointing ending to what could have been one of the best matches on the pay-per-view card. That ending, the match became almost forgettable and skippable, in my opinion, so... That's too bad. I thought they, that was kind of the low point of the uh, 
of the Cruiserweight week, and I thought it really should have been the high point. So anyways, on to Monday Night Raw! And before the match, there's an interesting backstage segment that showed the tension in the relationship between Neville and his sidekick TJ Perkins. Perkins starts to tease Neville about the fact that other people, other people, of course, are feeling that grabbing his grabbing of the ref was in desperation when he's about to tap out. And Neville reminds TJP to tread carefully as he will not allow slander. He reminds Perkins that Austin Aries is both of their problems as TJP needs to get past Aries to get a title shot. Neville says he'll help Perkins out, but he needs to start pulling his own weight and he should start in this match with Austin Aries that night on Raw. So anyways, before that match, we had Tony Nese the Brian Kendrick and Noam Dar in six-man tag team against Rich Swan, Akira Tozawa, and Gentleman Jack Gallagher. And Gallagher got a surprise for the other two partners as he brought them each their own umbrella. Of course, Jack Gallagher always walks around with his umbrella and does the Mary Poppins leap typically off the top rope with the umbrella extended to look like Mary Poppins and to yeah, just make a cool twist on a jump off the top rope attacking his opponent. Anyways, it was a good high-energy match, high-intensity Go way to showcase six of the best that the Cruiserweight division has to offer. Except for the announcers, there was not much to focus on ongoing storyline between some of these men. But there was storylines. Just, like I said, they didn't really showcase them much. Akira Tozawa had a chance to get the crowd into the match early on with his battle cry with his ah, 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 ah. But in the end, Jack Gallagher tags in, hits his corner dropkick on the Brian Kendrick and pins him to give the baby face the victory and make the crowd happy. A ah, good way to get the cruiserweights uh, showcased on, on Raw. And like I said, six of the main guys on the roster. Give the crowd a good taste of cruiserweight action. High energy, intense, fast-paced. We also had another match, of course, which we talked about earlier. The uh, the match that Neville was talking to TJP about. TJP versus A-Double Austin Aries. The fellow who failed to, re- or to gain the cruiserweight championship from Neville at Payback. It's another solid match. Neville's watching with, his, with interest in the backstage, of course, to see how his sidekick makes out in the match. The story of the match is that TJP injures and works the, the injured leg of Austin Aries throughout, throughout the, uh, the show. Uh, the injury keeps Aries from using his discus five-arm. Of course, they call it the discus five-arm because it's better than, uh, and more vicious than a discus four-arm. And they try to make the raw audience wonder if the injured leg will be the key to TJP pulling off the upset in the match. However, Aries finally gets TJP in the last chancery submission hold, and he's forced to tap out, giving Austin Aries the victory. After the match, TJP attacks Aries again, puts him in his leg injury submission hold, the knee bar, and keeps him there for a while, further injuring his leg. Finally, after TJP finishes doing the damage, he leaves the ring in a show-off fashion, leaving Austin Aries crawling around with his injured leg in the ring. We'll see if this injury uh, in the leg of Austin Aries carries over in the next couple weeks and plays into some of the future stories on the uh, the Cruiserweight division. Anyways, that was it for the matches on Raw. Then we have The Big Show 205 Live. And this was actually a pretty good show. Uh, it started off with TJP versus Lindsay Dorado. And we finally get to see the acrobatic luchador Lindsay Dorado back on 205 Live. It's, it's been a while. I was hoping we'd see Lindsay Dorado, Grand Metalik, or both on 205 Live or Raw sooner or later. Actually, the entire episode of 205 Live is matches that I've been advocating for. So it's almost like the WWE was reading my mind, or, or at least reading my power rankings, or something. Either way, we're definitely on the same page regarding the Cruiserweight division this week, me and the WWE. <laughs> so also interesting to note that despite his heel turn and his alignment with the Cruiserweight champion Neville, TJP still has roughly the same classic video game style character entrance, which I think is a bit too happy and cheery for a heel entrance. I mean, he does have a bit more attitude when he enters the ring, However, personally, I think he should change it up and, and really make an entrance that's more fitting of a bad guy or at least a, a video game villain or something. It's just, I don't know, it just doesn't fit the bill for me for a uh, villain cruiserweight wrestler. Anyways, of interesting note, TJ Perkins is now being referred almost entirely as TJP. And you hardly ever hear the last name of Perkins even mentioned anymore. Even when he enters and leaves the ring, he's being announced as TJP. So I think that's uh, the trend going forward. Anyways, this is relatively a short match, but far from being a squash match. These two actually had really good chemistry. Both are pretty agile high flyers. TJP tries to rip the luchador mask off Dorado on two occasions. The second one setting up his victory, actually. So after TJP pulls Dorado down by the mask on a second, on a second such occasion, as I mentioned, he quickly transitions into the knee bar submission hold, and Dorado taps out, giving TJP the victory in the match. 
It's another exciting match to open 205 live show as per usual. They almost always have an exciting and high energy match to get the show off to a good start. They know how to how to start a card off anyways. It was really good to see Lin Sidorado in this role anyways, and I hope we get to see more of him and Grand Metal League, or even both, more often. Perhaps even giving them a story of their own. Oh boy, whew, what a concept. <laughs> oh well. And after the high-paced opening match, comes my favorite segment. A quiet, intimate interview with the Brian Kendrick, the man with a plan, regarding the state of his ongoing lesson storyline with the Kira Tozawa. He talks about how he was insulted, because when Tozawa came to the Cruiserweight division, of course Kendrick offered to take him under his wing as a mentor, because he knew Tozawa well from wrestling with him in Japan, and of course was much more experienced than him. But uh, Tozawa refused and started getting caught up in the action, and fell in love with the WWE Universe and the way they responded to him in his battle cry. Ha! 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 And he lost focus on winning matches, apparently. Of course, Kendrick proceeded to cost Tozawa matches every week, teaching him a new lesson each time. And after costing Tozawa a number of matches and causing him a great deal of grief in the process of teaching him a total of ten lessons, Tozawa finally had enough. Tozawa then starts to get revenge by costing Kendrick matches, even beating him a couple of times, teaching him lessons of his own, such as appearances can be deceiving, which is a lesson actually Kendrick originally taught him. And then one's like, uh, you have to advise in the back of your head. And finally, choose your tag team partner, Watchley. Anyways, at the point where Kendrick was saying that he was done fooling around with, Tozawa, with him, Tozawa comes out of nowhere, kicking Kendrick in the side of the head. He then sits down and says, this is lesson number five. Always in an interview with a bang. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Tozawa is so entertaining, man. In my opinion, he should be the number one contender getting the next title shot. However, it's more likely Austin Aries will win the title finally at Extreme Rules. And then TJP will get the next title shot after Neville's rematch. Maybe a while before they ever exciting to hear here, Tozawa gets a title shot, unfortunately. Anyways, we have more matches to cover, so let's move things along. Two more important matches to get to still. So much action in the Cruiserweight division this week, man. Uh, anyways, we have Drew Gulak versus Mustafa Ali. This match is very important. As I've been saying that for Gulak's Cruiserweight crusade to really benefit him, it'll eventually have to get him a win, and preferably over Ali, who he's been antagonizing for so many weeks. This week, they finally have the match. And Gulak comes out to his usual no-fly zone sign and his... Megaphone saying, I'm not lying! No high flying! And of course they have a short vignette of Gulak acting like a politician, doing a commercial saying how Ali was reckless again last week and how he brings real change to 205 Live. Anyways, in the absence of time, I won't go into detail in the match, but it's a short battle of Mustafa Ali's flying moves versus Drew Gulak's ground and pound style. At the end, Ali goes to climb the rope to do his inverted 450 splash finisher, but Gulak grabs his leg and keeps him from climbing. Ollie hits him with a vicious enziguri, dropping him to the mat and then climbs to the top. But when he jumps off this time, he does a froggy splash. And Gulak raises his legs and Ollie lands hard on top of him. And Gulak quickly rolls him up for the one, two, three. And gets a huge victory over high-flying Mustafa Ali for his cruiserweight crusade. It's a much-needed victory. Really get the storyline going, as I was saying, because it, I don't know, it just, it was just a lot of talk until that point, so... Good to finally see you going. Anyways, after the match, Dasha interviews Gulak in the ring and asks him what his victory means to him. And he says the victory is, a, is huge for his campaign. Helps him prove that high flying doesn't work. He reminds people that he's the future of 205 Live. Drew Gulak. <laughs> Good luck, man. I hope you make the storyline work. And then finally, the main event of the 205 Live evening. And, of course, for you to appreciate how important and long-awaited this match is, I have to quickly recap the Alicia Fox storyline, as they do on the show as well. Originally, Alicia Fox was the girlfriend of cruiserweight Cedric Alexander. Noam Dar started trying to win her attention, though, week after week, giving uh, her attention, hitting on her, and referring to her as Alicia Fox. After a few weeks of this, Alicia Fox dumps Cedric Alexander and becomes Noam Dar's girlfriend. I need to add that shortly after this, too, Cedric Alexander gets hurt, for real and has been injured and unable to wrestle ever since, so that was unfortunate. And it was after this, Alicia Fox started receiving anonymous gifts every week, and Noam Dar kept being surprised by this, but pretending that they came from him. Finally, a number of weeks later, Rich Swan admitted to the audience that this was him who was sending these gifts to Alicia Fox. 
And of course, the following week, the three confronted each other in the ring, and Alicia Fox and Noam Dar called Rich Swan a liar, and Noam Dar reiterated that it was him who was sending these gifts to the beautiful Alicia Fox. At this point, another gift was delivered, and once again, Dar pretended the gift came from him, and that it was from the heart. However, when Alicia Fox opens the box, white powder blows out all over her. Rich Swan taunted Noam Dar as he exits the ring, basically saying, I told you so. I told you it was me who sent those gifts. Anyways, to make a long story short, too late! The next week, Alicia Fox dumps Noam Dar, essentially saying that she doesn't give two folks about him. Rich Swan says that the gifts were from his heart for her, and then she went on to give him a kiss, but he stops her and says that he was seeking revenge for his friend Cedric Alexander, who she broke the heart of, and that his real gift to her was showing the world what kind of person she was. Essentially, a gold digger. Although, she, of course, he doesn't actually tell her she's this. Pretty much that's what she is, so and that's what he's basically saying she is, in my opinion. Anyways, here we are, finally, a few weeks later, and Noam Dar finally gets his match to get revenge on Rich Swan. I've been advocating for this match to happen soon, and here it finally is. So anyways, Rich Swan enters the ring with his, ooh, ooh, can you handle this? Ooh, ooh, can you handle this? And his opponent, the Scottish supernova, Noam Dar! This is a pretty good grudge match. I won't go into a great detail on it, once again, in the name of saving time. If you want to see this main event, check it out on 205 Live on the WWE Network, or you may be able to find it live on YouTube, or perhaps. Uh, Rich Swan does a drop kick that's even nicer than Jack Gallagher early on in the match. And, of course, I usually rave about Jack Gallagher's drop kicks to begin with. Swan also does a leg drop with Noam Dar on the barricade, kind of similar to the corkscrew leg drop. He also almost wins the match when he hits him with a Phoenix Splash, but he only gets him with his arm, and he starts favoring his elbow in the process, and he's only able to hook the leg with one arm, and Dar is able to kick out. The match continues. In the end, though, Noam Dar works over Rich Swan's injured elbow, hits him with his running Enziguri finisher, and gets a huge victory to get a measure of revenge on Rich Swan. This is a huge climax moment in the Alicia Fox storyline. So that's the end, right? Happy ending to 205 Live? No, 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 no. Out comes Alicia Fox. Alicia Fox goes into the ring and seems to be asking Noam Dar to take her back. I'm thinking, no, she's a gold digger. Gold digger. However, Noam Dar seems to look at the audience and get their opinion. And then he opens his arms and cheers. Hey! And Alicia and him embrace. And Noam Dar actually jumps into Alicia Fox's arms. And she actually carries him around the ring. It was so beautiful. <laughs> Such a beautiful moment to end 205 Live. <laughs> oh, boy, I don't know. So what do you guys think? Should uh, Noam Dar have taken back Alicia Fox? Or do you think it was possible, even, that maybe they had it planned all along and they were messing with Rich Swan to teach him a lesson? When i, I got to admit, when I first saw the way Noam Dar reacted when he accepted Alicia Fox back, that maybe it was what... You know, maybe that was a situation, you know, that uh, they had it all planned out. I mean, know what you think, guys. I'm uh, curious what you know your opinions are about whether he should have taken her back, whether you would have taken her back. You know, what would you do? Also, what do you guys think of the uh, state of the cruiserweight division, the uh, storylines going on? What, what are you guys' opinions on what's going on with the cruiserweight division? You know, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about it. Anyways, that'll wrap it up for this week in cruiserweight action. Once again, this is the D-Job Danimal, Daniel Jobber. You can follow me at at Daniel Jobber with a capital D, capital J. And, of course, on Instagram, you can uh, follow me under Danimal Daniel Jobber, all lowercase letters. Be sure to visit my awesome website, DanimalDanielJobber.ca, where I keep lots of fun stuff. And I uh, keep my cruiserweight power rankings every week, which are always a uh, hit. People uh, seem to really like them, so I hope you'll check them out one of these times. And, of course, be sure to sign up for Discus, discuss, uh, whatever it's pronounced, at the bottom of the page. And leave me comments. Let me know you were there. Talk to me, man! Leave me words and comments. Talk to me. And please, be sure to check out our hosts, the Edmonton Sports Podcast Network. Shows like The Blown Call, Quick Calls with uh, Mike the Ref, CW Evolution, RCW Breakout, and, of course, the Sounds of Struggle podcast with Chris Parrish and Maniac. Seriously, guys, check these guys out, man. They're so entertaining to watch. You owe yourself a treat, a chance to check them out. and They cover all aspects of sports and, of course, wrestling. Yeah, man, real real breath of fresh air, great chemistry. I mean, you'll love it. They're, they're 
always a great listen to. So, yes, check them out. Be sure to check them out. That's uh, highly recommended by me. Anyways, remember, uh, if you like the Edmonton Sports Podcast Network, be sure to go to uh, whatamaneuver.net slash collections slash Edmonton hyphen SPN. The site should be in the comments down below. And, of course, buy merchandise, buy T-shirts, you know, any type of shirt. Support the network. Support great entertainment in the local Edmonton area. And, of course, local Edmonton wrestling. Uh, and, and follow them, too. You know, follow uh, Mike the Ref and uh, the Edmonton Sports Podcast Network at, at Edmonton SPN. That's a capital E on Edmonton and capital SPN at the end. And, of course, you can also follow Mike the Ref at uh, Mike the Ref EDM on Instagram. So make sure you uh, follow him there and keep up with all the action from the Edmonton Sports Podcast Network. So yeah, follow me, follow the network, buy merchandise. It's all worthwhile, man. It's all a way to support great entertainment in the Edmonton area. So anyways, I'm going to wrap it up with that. Always remember, friends, no matter what, you matter. Unless, of course, you multiply yourself by the speed of light squared. Then, my friends, you energy. This is Danimal Daniel Jobber, the D-Job. We'll see you next week on... Jobbing out with Danimal Daniel Jobber. Jobber out! Time to do the job! Behold the Jobber of Jobbers. Danimal Daniel Jobber. Ha 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 ha!